Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you all very much for coming to our presentation. Um, my name is Joan Williams. Um, just a slight correction, I'm not actually the Director of e-learning for the University, I'm the Director of e-learning for Undergraduate Medicine, <laughs> slightly smaller role, um, <laughs> at the University of Bristol um, in the United Kingdom. And, and I'm Suzanne Hardy, and I work for, as a Senior Advisor for an organisation called the Higher Education Academy, and I work for the Subject Centre for Medicine, Dentistry and Veterinary Medicine, and we have a remit to work with all of the schools of medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine right across the UK, um, and we've been in existence for about 10 years, and I'm based at Newcastle University. And um, although I seem to have the honour of, of having my name first on this paper, I would like to point out that actually this has been a real collaborative effort between myself, Suzanne, and Megan. Um, unfortunately, Megan drew the short straw and she couldn't come to Barcelona. So, um, and also, this is the first time I've given a presentation on the back of having a glass of carver. So I, I hope it goes OK. Um, It'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to start with a bit of background to, um, to the whole idea of a proposal for a consent commons. There's a history in the UK of um, funding programmes to create and share materials that goes back a long time. Um, I think Jane and I were just discussing when we first kind of got to know each other, and I think it was probably the Teaching and Learning Technology programme, which was in 1986. Um, and although the technology didn't support sharing as easily as it does now, that was definitely what it was about. It was about collaborative development, working across lots of institutions, creating materials that could be used across lots of different schools, in, in, particularly in medicine at that time. Um, and those projects have gone on and on and on, and the most recent one that, that we've worked together on is a, a project in, as part of the UK OER programme, um, and uh, Lee, Lee Yuan did a, um, a presentation on that earlier on today, just before lunch, and um, there's some representatives here from some of the other pro uh, projects that were in that programme, and our project in that programme was called Organising Open Educational Resources, and it was specifically, again, targeted at medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine. And every time that we look at human and animal health care as a subject, um, we have an issue of patients to deal with. And that's a specificity that's, that's to the healthcare disciplines that, that doesn't apply anywhere else, really, and, and gives us kind of a unique selling point for some of the work that we do. Um, another bit of background, there was a JISC-funded study um, in Edinburgh published in 2005, stroke six, which proposed what was then called a clinical commons, which was um, a common consent and licensing model for materials, clinical recordings of patients that were used in learning and teaching. And at five years ago, that concept, since five years ago, that concept's become more refined and the technology has become easier to use and things like Creative Commons have made it much easier for us to talk about these kinds of things. And at the time that that study was published, it was still quite blue sky um, and people weren't really sure what they had to do next with the proposals that were put forward by Rachel Alloway as, and she was at Edinburgh at the time. She's now at the University of Northern Ontario in Canada in the School of Medicine there. As I said, Creative Commons is much more established now and used a lot more. Um, it's beginning to be understood in UK HA as something which is useful and helpful and provides us with a recognised framework around which to build the idea of, of um, something that deals particularly with issues of clinical recordings in, for patients. Um, the OER movement has grown massively in the UK in the last 18 months, mainly due to £5.7 million being invested last year and £4.7 million this year from the, from the JISC. Um, and we had a project, as I said, in the first pilot programme, and we've got two projects in the next programme. Um, and they are, to, again, to share medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine resources. Um, the other driver that I really wanted to um, mention here is, is also just the growth in technology. Um, I think probably everyone in this room has some kind of device that takes, allows you to take a picture and probably allows you to pass that on to someone almost instantly. Um, so as I long think as it's, the internet's working. As long as the internet's <laughs> working. Um, so, of course, we have a situation now where, where consent has always been an issue for medicine, even before, even before technology. Um, but actually, we now have a situation where you can easily capture, easily transmit images around the world. And um, we, we, have, we, have to deal, we have to deal with the fact that, that technology is just um, changing everything. Um, but also, patients um, want to get this right with us. They want to, to help future uh, 
doctors. They want to help in their education. They are very happy to lend themselves to being filmed and being recorded. Mm -hmm. Doctors and other healthcare professions, they want to get the consent issues right as well. There's a great desire to share materials and a great desire to get this right. So that's the backdrop, really, of, of, of what we're working in. Um, and this is what we're talking about. We're talking about clinically sensitive images, images or videos or audio that show patients and show other people who aren't the patient but are part of that, part of that recording. Um, and clinical recordings, as I'm sure you're aware, as you may, many of you may have found yourself being a patient, are absolutely vital to um, the education of our doctors. Um, patients, families, other health professions are very willing to allow us to tell their stories, to take recordings, to share those with others, um, to help in, in education. Um, very often we will use um, students as role players or invite other role players in um, as actors. If they're paid professionally, they also have rights, um, performance rights, for example. Um, so a lot of issues that we need, we need to deal with. But of course, all the people, all these players are actually people and they have rights and we, we have to make sure that we, we give those rights some respect. Um, so it's actually about respect for people. It's about honouring their expectations. What are their expectations about what's going to happen to those images? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to be hosted? Who's going to see them? Also their expectations about the relationship with the doctor. Yes, that's right. When you're taking consent, you're actually entering into a contract with the doctor. Um, and we need to make sure that we behave properly. And also if we're going to onward transmit those images... Anyone involved with dealing with those images or handling those images also, ne images also needs to um, have, uh, have this kind of identity with the patient, even though you may not know them, but need to have that kind of relationship that handles those images with respect. Mm -hmm. So what we're here to talk about today is a proposal for a consent commons, which will allow us to deal with this additional issue of patient and non-patient consent in reusing and sharing clinical recordings for use in open resources to support healthcare education against this real desire to share. And we need to be able to capture and share recordings for use in learning and teaching. And whilst we can probably deal quite adequately with the copyright issues and ownership and authorship issues, we haven't really a structure for dealing with consent in open educational resources. So copyright and licensing is about ownership and about authorship. And that's about the person who owns or creates that resource. But consent is about the right to take and the right to disclose information from patients and relates to privacy and confidentiality issues and legislation. And we need to be able to, we need to take heed of that. As authors and owners of, of um, open educational resources, we have to be aware of that relationship with, with patients. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind just labouring that point, actually, that the processes of copyright and licensing are very separate from the process of consent, and we mustn't conflate those issues um, when we're thinking about this. And it's interesting that this session is titled Copyright and IPR, and consent has very little to do with copyright and IPR. Um, so I just want to... It's a bit of a soapbox of mine, I'm afraid. Um, what, what this slide shows is... Uh, sorry, these, these screens aren't working for us, so I'm going to have to kind of look up here. But... What this, this screen is illustrating is actually what happens in practice when you take and share a clinical recording. On the left, in the clinical setting, the doctor or another professional member of staff will collect the consent from the patient. Um, they will take the recordings. They will store that consent um, along with the patient record. Um, and for all that process, there's a lot of very clear guidance in the UK. In fact, there's almost too much guidance. Sometimes it can be confusing. But there is good guidance about how to do that, how to take that process, what to do with the consent form, um, et cetera, et cetera. Moving into the academic setting on the right, though, um, what we want to do is we want to take those recordings and incorporate them into some educational event. And in the past, that would have been a slide in a lecture theatre. Of course, now we want to upload that to our VLE. We actually want to share it um, as an open educational resource. Um, the difficulty we have is we don't have the evidence of that consent. That is actually stored with the patient record. We are not allowed to link to the patient record. We are not allowed to get into those systems. So the location of risk is unclear. As it moves from a clinical setting across into an educational setting, where is the risk? Where, who, where are the responsibilities of those institutions? Where does the responsibility of the uh, NHS, our National Health Service, stop? 
you know, where does the responsibilities of higher education start? And both are very aware of these issues and both are, are asking questions about, well, you know, how do we deal with that process? Um, and in and how do we fact, manage it that? It might often be the same person who's collecting the recording, making a learning and teaching object uh, or an, a, an educational resource in the, in the clinical setting. And then they might, just, they might even be in the same room, but because of the way that contracts work, they're then under an academic setting delivering something to undergraduate students. And in reality, what that means is that somebody who is paid by the NHS, their, their contract, their, their remuneration comes from the NHS. They're paid to be a clinician. They make the resources during that clinical time or when they're not treating patients. Um, and they have an honorary contract with the university, typically, um, which they don't get paid for. So it's a, it's, a, it's a written contract, but it's an honorary contract, and there's no money changes hands. So what happens then is um, when that person moves into their academic setting, it's unclear, as Jane said, where the location of risk lies. And universities are very unclear who actually has jurisdiction over where those images, where those recordings go, and how they're used within um, the learning management system, for example. And, and in my role, it's quite simple. Because I'm dealing with the clinical setting and the, e and, and the higher education setting, I can make sure I have a copy of the consent form. I can store that with our images or our recordings in our content management system. I can tick the box that says, only make that material available to Bristol if we don't have a, a level of consent that means that we can be OER. I can do that. But, of course, in the OER world, where the people wanting to use a resource or disaggregate that resource, is going to, it could be an institution halfway around the world, from the cl clinical setting in which that recording originated. There's no way at the moment for you to be clear about the consent mm -hmm. that's been given in any of these recordings. Next slide. The fundamental thing is that we all want to do the right thing. And um, we want, universities aren't aware of their responsibility in this setting. Doctors want to do things properly. Learning technologists want to do things properly. Universities want to do things properly but we just don't have the framework to allow us to do that at the moment. What we need is something that works alongside copyright and licensing regimens to give us something to evidence or give provenance to materials which require consent under data protection law so that onward transmission, sharing and reuse becomes easier and we can open up more healthcare materials to use as open educational resources whilst respecting the autonomy and rights of patients and respecting the moral and, and, and upholding moral and ethical practice. Um, I don't think it's enough to say, I'm the owner of this resource, I can do whatever I want with it. Um, if it's got a clinical recording in it and data about a patient in it, we have to take heed of that. So, as I say, copyright might be very clear, we can probably tick that box, consent is much less so. And the c consent um, issue has, is a real barrier. In the UA project that we ran last year, we, we found that consent was re really a massive barrier to open release, especially with uh, legacy materials. As Jane said, we can't evidence the consent status of the recordings that are used within them, and we have to use clinical recordings. They're the only thing that give us authentic, situated, grounded data for, patients to act, for uh, students to actually work with. So what we ended up with in that project was the majority of the materials that we did release um, ended up with a non-commercial no derivatives license as a default rather than what we would prefer, which would be a fallback position and be able to use a much more open license. Um, and that's where we can apply them. Oftentimes we can't at all. Everyone wants to use more open licenses. So it's not about doctors saying, I don't want to use an open license. They all want to make things as openly available as possible. Um, but it's this issue of being able to evidence consent clearly, easily, and across boundaries. Um, what we wanted to do, this is a an x-ray, and we just wanted you to think for a moment about whether you think that would have a problem with consent. Um, actually, it might be interesting. Let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that there is an issue of consent with this image? Okay, who thinks there isn't? One. <laughs> How many people don't know? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, that's a really good illustration of our point. Um, but also, the, the General Medical Council, who provides guidance on taking recordings um, for, um, within medicine, um, actually says, actually, this is okay, because it's, as long as there's no identifiable patient information in that image, then we can just use these images in, in our materials, as long as you can't identify the patient. But 
if that patient had some kind of interesting body piercing, actually you would be able to recognise that patient and make the connection back to the patient. So at what point can you or can you not recognise the patient? It's very, very blurred. And that has led us to make a recommendation from the OER, the OER project that actually let's just get consent. Whatever it is, let's just get consent and let's just make it as easy as that so that it's all very clear. And we think this is something that in the, in the clinical arena, this is something we should all be doing anyway, in the same way as we collect and store consent for treatment and research, and in the same way as we reference in publications. It should be as easy and embedded in practice as that. We all know how to reference according to what our institution or publications want us to do. It's about good practice, which is easy and practical to implement. It's about covering our backs and trying to think further down the line about making the consent status clear for other users who may use a recording in an onward transmission in a different way. So uh, we think that um, we'd like to propose a consent commons to work alongside or with Creative Commons as a way of demonstrating diligence in dealing with issues of consent and using patient data sensitively in learning and teaching. And um, hopefully it would um, ameliorate uncertainty about the status of educational resources with the recordings of people in them. We're, how are we doing it? Well, it, we, as I said, we've got another project within the um, UK OER programme, and we've got this project, uh, which we have a nice abbreviation of Porsche, probably copyrighted, don't know. Um, anyway, so we're developing the Consent Commons proposal further with support from some friends at Creative Commons UK, and we're working with the NHS eLearning repository to encourage further use of Creative Commons licences for educational materials in the NHS. And as UK citizens, um, we all pay for those things because we all pay for the NHS through our, through our taxes and national insurance, and we should have access to it. Okay. Um, now, as far as uh, Consent Commons goes, that's that may or may not sound, sound a good idea, but actually it's not going to be very much good unless we also have some accompanying work underneath all of that, um, helping people really understand how to consent um, properly and, and some agreement about how, the, how all this works between clinical and educational settings. And um, a lot of people within, both within um, healthcare and educational settings are quite exercised by this. And last November we held uh, a workshop um, bringing together people from both sides to look at all of these issues. And the idea of that workshop was that people came up with a number of proposals um, that would be funded by the JISC. Um, actually, what came out was, were six completely different, well, not completely different, but very connected, actually, ideas that actually ended up forming a programme of work, which is now going forwards. And um, does my little thing work up there? Is that working? No, yeah, it is. Okay. So what you've got up here... What, what you have up here is, um, along the top we've got the NHS settings, down at the bottom we have the HG settings. Um, what was agreed, though, was there was a lot of things that people wanted to do, advice and training, sharing the real picture. This was the idea that people would share their horror stories. Um, we'd have a conference, we'd do workshops. Um, um, and there were, but, th th but there were these things that we really needed to work across both um, settings, which were universal principles of information governance. The idea that we would have this common code of practice, a common set of principles, possibly even a common consent form, and that's got big question marks by it. I don't know if you can achieve that. But this work is now proceeding, and we now do have a common, a very draft set of core principles. The key thing is that the task force are from members of the General Medical Council, the Higher Education Academy, the, the GIS, the Institute for Medical Illustrators, lots of bodies. And these are the people steering this project, and these are the people disseminating the results of that project with the idea that we do have this shared agreement about these things. And that work is actually now happening and, and underway. So um, in terms of taking the idea of Consent Commons further, we do think that helps on the way in making more clinical teaching materials available. We desperately need more authentic learning experiences for future clinicians. Um, the only real data that can depict the complexity of a clinical encounter when we go to the doctors, when we go to the doctors, um, sorry, well, the only real data um, 
that can depict the complexity of a clinical encounter is, is real patient data. Because when we go to the doctors, when I go to the doctor, when you go to the doctor, we don't present simply with one condition. So it's very easy to kind of make a simulation that says this is what happens when somebody has a heart condition. But actually that's probably linked to diabetes, to other things as well. And they're much more difficult to represent in a simulation and much more expensive um, to, to make as well. So uh, what we'd like to do is feedback from um, people like you and, and from uh, other people in the Commons communities to talk about whether this idea is, is an idea that, that could go forward and might have uh, use in, in other situations. So please find us throughout the rest of the conference and talk to us about these ideas and let us know if you think they'd be useful. You can also email us. This is um, my email address and Jane's email address. Anything that happens on, on this um, on this idea, we'll be putting onto the Medev website at the OER pages there. Uh, hopefully that work's going to develop quite quickly over the next six months. We're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. If you have any questions. So one thing that, that occurred to me is, is in the, the defense sector in the United States, uh, there have been some research papers that have found that software inferencing, so software that can make logical conclusions based on open data, have actually derived classified information. I was wondering if anybody had considered that, that once the, the public information that's out there that might not even be personally identifiable goes into the open space and inferencing is done on that information, you might derive things that are actually behind the consent wall. And it, I was just curious if that had been discussed. Uh, in a word, no. <laughs> I mean, there, there are similar, similar things that have happened in the UK where people have left CDs with patient data on trains and things oh, like that. So, um, but I think, uh, I think in some ways that's, that's kind of outside of the remit of what we've been talking about. We're talking about evidence and that consent's been taken and making sure that when a learning and teaching resource goes back, that it has a little symbol on it somewhere that says, you know, that's why we want to work with Creative mm -hmm. Commons. We, we feel that it would be very easy that's something that people know and understand, to add one little extra symbol that says this has got consent and it's been obtained in the right way and here's the link back to the person who owns that consent, for example. We don't want to talk about technologically about how this might work because I think there's lots of different solutions about ways forward that we could go with it. But also that will be quite clear about what you can and can't do with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent you had to deal with an existing legal regime around patient privacy. In the United States, we have lots and lots of, of rules around that, and so yeah. any project like this would, would run up against those immediately. Yeah. So, How does that work in the UK? That's basically my it's, question. It's very similar. In fact, I think it's probably more difficult in the UK following on from um, Alder Hay and uh, the Bristol Organ Retention. Jane knows quite a lot about the Bristol Organ Retention Standard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, quite a bit, yeah. So I think um, following things like that, plus the Shipman case in the UK, have meant that um, anything to do with anything linked to a patient is much more heavily regulated, which is why I think the whole issue of being able to evidence consent in learning and teaching resources has become more, uh, more important than it ever has been before. And that's why it's not enough to say, as the owner of a resource, I've got copyright, and I'll only keep it, that, I'll keep it there until somebody challenges me. That's really not enough. That's how... Bristol organ retention scandal happened and we have talked in talks previously about um, in a kind of sc scary way that um, unless we do something about this we actually have got a time bomb waiting to happen with legacy learning and teaching materials that have no con consent status attached to them and that's a really scary position to be in in a higher education institution that has courses in medicine dentistry and veterinary medicine. But the things the things like the old hay and and the Bristol um or um, baby's heart scandal is that um, there are opportunities because yeah. people are now very aware um, for example the Bristol situation actually legally nothing, nothing was wrong, ethically mm. the families were not informed mm. that organs would be retained from, from their children if they, what transpired was if they had known and if they had been consented properly they wouldn't have had a problem about it they just didn't know mm. so it's the, it's the ethics that kind of go slightly wonky but those situations actually become our opportunities mm. because people are very aware now and actually want to get it right. Um, the families want to get it right. Mm. And um, so it is an opportunity for us, actually. 
I understand the need for privacy. Um, in the U.S., we have the HIPAA requirements. Have you considered the possibility of doing some sort of anonymous coding when it comes to uh, the ownership of that, that content so that the, the person can be reached but anonymously uh, as needed? Well, it, wouldn't, it would never be the patient who was contacted unless it was by the clinician who took the original consent. So the link would only ever have to go back to that clinician um, because we can't, we, uh, because of the way that patient records and patient data is protected in the UK, you can't go back and talk to a patient directly. So that's why any kind of technological solution would have the clinician as the, the person who took the consent as the ultimate endpoint and the contact person. And it's never, it's never possible to anonymize anything completely unless it's kind of a cell culture or something like that. Yeah, I think it's just better. I, th I think it's better to go the other way yeah. and get the consent and be clear. It's not hard to do. Because it's not hard. People think it is, but it's not hard. Um, it's actually a very, very simple procedure. Um, and I think that's the safest way rather than trying to get, you know, we have 200 plus NHS trusts, we have 200 plus higher education institutions, let alone any other educational settings, trying to get them to agree on a way of codifying. Mm -hmm. That even though we are supposedly having a national patient record system, well, let, let's watch this space. But we've been waiting for that for at least 20 you, you years. You know, I, uh, yeah. Um, one of the features of Creative Commons licenses is that they're irrevocable, mm -hmm. so that once you've accepted a work under a CC license, um, you, there's you don't have ambiguity about whether this license is still valid. Uh, are there issues around re revoking consent? Have you thought about how those might be uh, addressed? I think at the policy level is probably the, um, the, I've got a message from Megan anyway, she says, my friend, she says, hello, you're the author there. Um, she, I should have had to say that if I saw you. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the reasons why we're keen on working with Creative Commons on taking this idea forward is because of that irrevocability. And also, you know, as Jane alluded to, once you put something on the internet, even if you take it down, it's never really gone. So being able to, we, we've got to be able to evidence that consent for legacy materials. Of course, if somebody requests that something's taken down, we all have, should have reasonable takedown policies and, and take things down as we say we're going to in order to be able to counteract those wishes of the patient. It's, that's fine. I mean, that demonstrates due diligence and legally in the UK. As long as we did that, we, we wouldn't have legal problems, I don't think. So... Um, there, there is an issue about takedown, but if you've got policies that support that, it, I don't think the licensing needs to be a needs to be a barrier. But the other thing is that you write that into your consent form. So when you consent a patient, um, you, you have a form that they sign, but you also have an information sheet, and part of that information sheet says that you have the right to withdraw your consent at any time, and you give your details to be contacted. Um, and if they contact you, you have a take you have you have a takedown policy, and you take it down. But the information sheet says that, of course, if you've agreed for it to be made available, even in a VLE, that's still not really you know that's still public domain because you can right click and download. Um, then, um, you know, we have a we, we have to take it down, but we also have to let them know that we may not be able to get rid of every possible source. In practice. Patients still give us their consent. In practice, if any of them are going to withdraw, they do it within the first three months. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of what other people do is, is we tend to have a two-step procedure. You have a consent to take an image. And it, this quite often depends on the sensitivity of, of, of what you're filming. But you have a stage process where you, you consent to take the image and then you consent to use and you invite the patient back in to view the material because it's very, it's very different once you've viewed your own material how you may feel about that. Um, and very often they will, evidence is that they will withdraw in the first three months. So the other alternative is that you, you make it available to your students for the first three months before you make it more openly available. And that, I think, catches most of it. <laughs>